Did you know that there is a relationship between the size of fire trucks and the amount of damage done to a flat during a fire? The bigger the truck sent to put out the fire, the bigger the damages tend to be. The solution is simple. Just send smaller fire trucks. Wait, that doesn't sound right, does it? Our brain is a huge causal machine, so it can instinctively feel it's not credible that size of truck and amount of damage done are causally related. There must be another variable somewhere explaining the correlation. Here, it's of course the seriousness of the fire. Even better, it's the common cause of the two correlated variables. Your brain does that automatically, but what about your computer? How do you make sure that it doesn't just happily and mistakenly report the correlation? That's when causal inference and machine learning enter the stage, as Robert Osazua Ness will tell us. Robert has a PhD in statistics from Purdue University. He currently works as a research scientist at Microsoft Research and is a founder of altdeep.ai, which teaches live cohort-based courses on advanced topics in applied modeling. As you'll hear, his research focuses on the intersection of causal and probabilistic machine learning, and maybe that's why I invited him on the show. Well, who knows? Causal inference is very hard. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 56, recorded December 15, 2021. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbasestats.com. That's learnbasestats.com. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive Bayesian swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash learnbasestats. Starting at 3 euros, you can get various benefits like the private MBS Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash learnbasestats. Thanks a lot, folks. I'm very grateful for any support you can bring. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen, maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard Feynman. hello my dear Bayesian folks always one of my favorite things to do when recording episodes is thanking my brand new supporters on patreon especially those in the full poster tier or higher this time i am talking about the unique sven de Meyer, yoshiyuki amajima and michael the crescenzo Thank you, folks. This really makes a huge difference and helps the podcast tremendously. And now, let's talk causal inference and machine learning with Robert Osazuba Ness. Robert Ness, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for taking the time. And also, I want to thank Michael Ostege for introducing us. Michel is a fellow PyMC core developer, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, he suggested me to have you on the show. So, Michel, vielen Dank, if you are listening to us. <laughs> and uh, maybe, Robert, uh, like, uh, tell us how... Do you know my Michel from any Bayesian stuff, or is it uh, completely unrelated? No. When I met him, we were working at a company called Zymergen uh, in, in uh, the Bay Area. It's mm-hmm. a biotech company. And I was leading a project to implement a decision-making under uncertainty system using probabilistic programming. He was doing really interesting things with uh, graph neural networks at the time. It was later on that he started working with the PyMC folks. And um, I like to think that it was the kind of things that we talked about as Imogen that got him interested in the stuff in the first place, but I can't speak for him. (laughs) Yeah, so we'll see. Michael will tell us. (laughs) In a future episode, maybe in a matchmaking dinner episode, actually. And if you folks want to hear about Michael's story, uh, he was in episode 43, if I remember correctly, about the RT Live model that um, he worked on for the European side. And that was a joint episode with Thomas Vladek, 
who was one of the first guys working on those uh, on this model. So that's um, an interesting episode uh, on COVID modeling. So definitely go back in and, and check this out. But for this episode, we are gonna focus on you, Robert, <laughs> and start by your background as usual. So yeah, basically what is your origin story? Yeah, I suppose the short version, I studied economics and China studies at Johns Hopkins Science. I, I wanted to be an economist. Mm. Then I realized that the part of economics that I really liked was the math and the statistics. So I, I veered towards a uh, statistics degree. I was living in China at the time and I was working there and then decided to come back to the States to do PhD in statistics. I went to Purdue. Then upon graduating from Purdue, I uh, Worked as a research engineer and research scientist at various companies in industry. Is that a good summary? <laughs> yeah, but that's maybe even too short. I wanted to keep a brief sort of follow up questions. Otherwise, <laughs> I'll just keep going yeah. on ranting. <laughs> okay, so yeah, interesting to see that you you started by economics, but uh, actually went went another way now. So I'm curious, why did you? Why did you want to study economics in the first place, maybe? So an undergraduate, I enjoyed quantitative analysis style fields. And so I was, I was taking, it was taking a bunch of courses in finance and in strategy and in, um, and economics and, and just I very much enjoyed them. I figured that, you know, economics was a thing that I would really enjoy doing. So I tried to figure out, okay, well, if I was going to get a PhD in economics, you know, what would what would be the requirements? So I started doing more math. I had already kind of come in on an engineering scholarship to undergrad, so I had a little bit of math under my belt, and so it wasn't hard to take more. And I took my first statistics class uh, in undergraduate, like you know, advanced statistics. So it was um, it was a categorical statistics, so hmm. cross tab and all that kind of stuff, and and enjoyed it and did well. And then I was focused on economics and, and I remember, <laughs> I remember being, so I was trying to get, I was in China. I had come to China and done a program, learned a language and I wanted to kind of do economic development in, in China. I was kind of inspired by people like Amartya Zen and I ended up so it turns out if you don't have like any advanced schooling in economics, nobody's going to hire you to do economics. It's like, that's one of those things that I guess I had to figure out without, somebody could have told me that, but <laughs> I figured it out on my, the hard way. And so I, but I heard that if you would kind of go to more development intensive areas, then you could work as a, you know, get field work that might be ap applicable to, you know, a graduate that would help you maybe think about a longer term career in economics. So I went out west and I was working in a part of, let's see, a part of Sichuan province that wasn't part of, wasn't formally part of Tibet, but was um, on the Tibetan plateau and was populated by a lot of ethnic Tibetans. And it's interesting. There's sort of the project I was working on with it was within with a um, an NGO called Winrock. They were trying to so in Chinese medicine, there's a particular thing that is extremely valuable. It's called in Chinese chongcao. In English, it's a, it's a medical term. It's a kind of some people who are listening are going to know it once I describe it. It's a fungus that infects insects, particularly in this in this area, was uh, affected these caterpillars, and it would get into their brains and like turn them into these zombies that would cause the caterpillars to like to climb to a, a high place, and then it would kill them, and then sprouts a big mushroom out of their head and then spread spores out where it would go kill a bunch of other caterpillars. And that mushroom was <laughs> valuable in Chinese medicine. In fact, you can, you know, you see it, I, you see it in Chinese kind of uh, stores in Chinatowns in the States. You can get it on Amazon. Hmm. It's expensive stuff. And, what, but the problem was because it was so valuable that it was being harvested to extinction. And so this was a project to help local communities sustainably harvest this resource. And yeah, um, sorry, I forgot the name of the substance, but you can put it in the show notes, I guess. But it, uh, I know that it helps fortify the blood. <laughs> hmm. So that was my first exposure to kind of like developing economics. And of, and of course, like, you know, without obviously getting into the 
background politics of of the region, you know, that those political issues and those uh, and just the, the the kind of sheer economic speed of China, where like you knew that at any point some developer was going to come and the, and just whatever it is you had, you were working on, they were just going to pave over it and build some luxury hotel, and so that. I suppose was a bit of a disillusionment. And I think had I, you know, maybe if I had done a different project, the outcome would have been different. But I, and so that, that maybe kind of maybe pivot away a little bit from the kind of the naive idealism of develop of kind of that a you know recent graduate un, might have about uh, the, you know saving the world of economics, and maybe nudge me more in the direction of the quantitative side, which I'd already been interested in and was able to kind of lean in more, and then eventually just figured out, well, if this is what I'm into, then why don't I just do statistics? Since that's the part that I'm that really gets me excited. Hmm. Yeah, so so like in the end you ended up liking the methods more than the field. Right. Like it's the like the the methods to come up with the answers to the interesting questions you were asking ourselves became became more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. But coming all the all the time from a, a deep interest for scientific reasoning and, and method. Mm-hmm. I see. Okay. Very interesting. I didn't know about that uh, fungi, but uh, well, <laughs> don't really want to mess with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, how would you define what you're doing nowadays? Okay, I remember the name of the fungi. It's oh, I just looked it up. Rather, it's a uh, cordyceps. I think generally, cordyceps means that whole school of fungi. So, if you ever maybe people out there, there's a zombie movie called The Girl with All the Gifts. That's about a or or the video game where the last of us that's those are all about what if cordyceps infected humans hmm. <laughs> like that's uh it's called cordyceps sinensis hmm. that's the name of the fungus can it actually infine, uh, infect humans or not i hope not yeah i hope not either <laughs> <laughs> not that i've heard of uh, <laughs> okay but, you know these days you never know <laughs> yeah one virus at a time please. <laughs> yeah i think yeah i saw in a, one of these magazines you see at airports is like you know the next big pandemic is a fungal pandemic so take what you <laughs> that's cool yeah <laughs> yeah so um i was asking you and now so today uh what would you define what you're doing sure i'm um so these days i do research and write about and teach courses on you know advanced applied modeling so in terms of research i'm a research scientist at msr microsoft research and um, i'm also founder of a company called all deep where i teach about um online uh, it's i run these online cohorts uh, for advanced topics in machine learning including probabilistic modeling uh, a popular course on causal modeling i also write about these topics in the newsletter so Teaching, reading, and research. Um, did uh, and then off and, and I've done a lot of engineering, like production ready engineering for the, since I've been in industry. So less these days now that I've joined MSR, um, they have way better engineers than I do than I than I am. Um, so I get to focus a bit more on the fundamentals of research at MSR. Well, then I have to ask how Bayesian stats fit into all that. Yeah, so. I would definitely consider myself a Bayesian statistician. So when I say that, I mean that um, I believe in quantifying subjective knowledge and uncertainty with probability when doing inference. And I also think that the point estimate or the prediction is never really the point. The point is to make a decision. And that Bayesian decision theory is a great way to make decisions. And um, beyond that, I've always very much liked the math and the algorithms behind Bayesianism. I really, when I was in graduate school, uh, random processes, uh, simulation, computational Bayes, these were always, um, in terms of learning, the things that I had to learn to be, be called a statistician and pass qualifying exams and get my PhD, some of the things I was less enthusiastic to learn and some things I was more ex- enthusiastic to learn about, the things that are in the orbit of Bayesianism were certainly the things that much more, were much more appealing to me as a learner. And so do you, do you still today work with the, these kind of methods? Yeah, definitely. I do a lot of work with probabilistic programming. Mm. Um, and so you, know, you don't have to be, I suppose you don't technically have to be Bayesian in terms of inference or epistemology when it comes to working with probabilistic programs, but 
obviously there's a very there's an intersection there. Yeah. And yeah, if I'm if I'm writing a paper and I'm trying to submit to a conference, mm-hmm. whatever method I'm using is probably going to be a Bayesian method. Unless it's yeah, you know, unless there's a re- there's a good reason not to. Okay, interesting. We'll get back to that. So, but but first, um, I'd like to ask you if you remember when you first got introduced to Bayesian stats and and if you found them attractive at first or if it took you a bit of time, because economics is not really known for its uh, Bayesian, let's say, preference. Yeah, as you know, I think th- so. During my PhD. You know, you would hear you're, you're, you're my, it's my first year there, first and second year there. I'm trying to just pass the basic qu- the classes, and I mean, this I don't, you know, to that maybe to other statisticians who are listening to this, it won't come as a surprise that there was no Bayesianism or Bayesian inference 101 in our curriculum. And so I immediately learned, you know, I, that I was way better at statistics than I was at probability. And that might have been the instructor, but I don't know, probably the instructor wasn't my favorite. But I found that I kind of had superpowers when it came to statistical inference. And like when I, I remember there was this exam, our first kind of exam in like the, in the PhD level stats theory class. And I just breezed through it in a half an hour and got a perfect score. And everybody was just looking at me. I was getting, I was like, I was afraid that I had lost like a part of the exam booklet or something like that. But uh, I realized very early that, okay, this statistical estimation theory stuff is something I'm pretty good at. And people had been talking about Bayesianism. So I started leading more onto, you know, into courses that were focused on. So, you know, we had, you can, you can go in the direction of kind of advanced probability theory. You can go in the direction of uh, applied methodology. And I was going more in the direction of estimation. And then I took a course by a, a professor named John Dealey. And he was interesting. He didn't do research, he basically did one thing, which was teach this class on applied Bayesian decision theory. I'd say that was the class that got me hooked. It was, I'm trying to remember the different things from the class, but I remember just being really engrossed by every single topic he he brought up and really enjoying it. But then there was also computational statistics, so we had to, as PhD students, we had to pass a comp stats qualifying exam. And our, you know, so an American kind of, I don't know, I can't speak for every institution, but the way it worked at our, at our program is that you had to like pass three different qualifying exams and get a minimum score on each of them. And, so, and you could choose probability, uh, stats theory, uh, methodology, and computational stats. And so I focused on comp- passing the computational stats exam amongst others. And so that required me to learn a lot about computational bays because lots of the the computational elements of statistics, once you get past like expectation propagation, most of the uh, algorithms are Bayesian in flavor. And so um, I bought a book uh, on stochastic modeling and systems biology by a guy named Darren Wilkinson who incidentally is making a lot of Im- impact on the in the probabilistic programming community nowadays but he had written this book on writing kind of dynamic and mechanistic models but also was very very heavy on computational bays and had all kinds of different flavors of MCMC and i remember spending a summer just using that book to learn more about different ways of doing MCMC and and yeah that that book got me past my qualifying exam i got involved with those uh, have you heard of these bayesian summer schools in Como, Italy. Hmm. I have not, but that sounds fascinating because Como in Italy <laughs> is a very, very beautiful place. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember off the top of my head the institution that runs it, but if you search Beijing Summer School Como, yeah, every it's, it's basically like two months uh, every summer. I think they they might have stopped for COVID these last two years, and they and they usually bring in somebody who's doing something interesting in, in Bayesian theory, and then that person gives them basically a two week. A one or two week, I think it might be just one week. Or they give it basically a a week long or weeks long seminar on that topic with code examples. And so I had gone through a few of those. I really enjoyed those. And also my, my PhD research centered on causal modeling, particularly using causal Bayesian networks to do causal modeling. Now, Bayesian networks are not strictly Bayesian. Of course, you can use different non-Bayesian approaches to estimating the parameters of those models. But the inference algorithms that you run on a Bayesian net or a graphical model in general are typically Bayesian in flavor. Uh, and so from kind of graphical models, I graduated to probabilistic programming languages like PyMC. And I've been thinking for a long time about how to combine those languages with 
causal modeling and, and inference. I see how that all fits together. That's super interesting. So first I just Googled and apparently, yeah, that uh, summer school on Lake Cuomo is, um, is something that does exist. So if any listeners know it. about that, tell me I should go there, you know, as a field trip to record a podcast over there. And I am living in Milan these days. So, I mean, that's just very, yeah, it's what, like, very it's close. Like 45 minutes away or so, yeah. Exactly. So <laughs> very happy to do that. And second, uh, yeah, you answered the follow questions I had because you said you work a lot with probabilistic programming languages. And so, yeah, I was interested in your workflow. Uh, what do you usually use and in which language? So it seems like you, you're mostly using Python and PyMC. I not a big user of PyMC. I use Pyro, which is an extension of PyTorch, mm -hmm. uh, largely because Pyro has a do operator, mm. which is an important operator in causal reasoning, mm -hmm. but also because languages like PyMC and Stan, there's one abstraction in that in those languages that I I'm not a huge fan of. I, I recognize that they're very useful and, and important. And, and, and frankly, I'm writing a paper now where I'm using Stan just because it's way easier to debug than Pyro. But in uh, but what Pyro, you can write a model, and that model doesn't have any. You can separate modeling from inference, and that separation of abstraction, I think, is important when you're thinking about you know the data generating process and how to reason causally about it. So, for example, in Py in PyMC, you have like you usually have to kind of tell the model what is parameters and what is observed, and thus a likelihood function or part of the likelihood, and so. That to me is a kind of mixing of abstractions in terms of, you know, when you're talking about what's prior, what's likelihood, what's posterior, then you're talking about an inference problem. If you're just talking so, uh, purely about a data generating process, and then maybe you're using priors there to quantify your uncertainty about parameters in that data generating process, then that's a modeling problem. And you know, one thing that I'm very much interested in is is in effective ways of separating separating modeling from inference, making inference abstractions that makes it makes inference more accessible. But the more you can separate modeling from inference, the more you can make in my opinion, the modeling approach accessible to non-statisticians, non-Bayesian computational inference experts, and that's important to me. That's interesting. And we'll definitely talk more about the, the do operator. I didn't know Pyro had that, but that, that, sounds, um, that sounds really great. And I should say one more thing. If we're talking about that, one more interesting thing about Pyro is that, so in potential outcomes causality, there's this abstraction called a single world intervention graph. Which is so you know the do operator is more per, you know Perlian as as in uh, Judah Pearl style of causal inference um, way of thinking about causality, while the um, single world intervention graph is more from the Ru Ruben Newman causal modeling framework, and also called potential outcomes, and that is also implemented in Pyro by default. So if you're uh, using Pyro for causal inference, it gives you that for free. It's another plug for Pyro. Perfect. Uh, should definitely put the Pyro docs in the show notes. So it seems that you, uh, I'm curious about what you focus on because people who say they work, they work a lot on PPLs. Often they are developing PPLs, but not necessarily writing models, which is an interesting thing. Like writing a PPL is so specialized and complex that in the end you might end up like not working a lot on models although they are written to do modeling so where are you on that on that point uh, actually at spectrum yeah so. i you know i've i would need a lot of justification to write my own ppo i've actually written some so in, in a previous company i worked for we had a proprietary probabilistic programming language and and i worked a lot more on yeah on the inference abstractions i added some causal inference abstractions i added some inference algorithms but uh, yeah it's a lot of work and that was a nice setting because we were a company and we were trying to use our ppl to solve i mean they still exist their name is gamelon you know we were trying to use the ppl to solve our own problems that were and trying to have business impact and so in, th in that case you're building something that is aligned with a roadmap a product roadmap so that i wouldn't mind doing again but there are some causal reasoning algorithms that i'd like to write that even ppls like pyro don't particularly make it easy to implement 
And I would, if I were going to write my own algorithm, I would, if I were going to write my own PPL, it would be to solve those kinds of problems because there's nothing out there that really scratches the itch I want to scratch. But even then, it's because there's an itch, not because I'm just interested in the nuances of scratching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you're definitely more on the on the modeling side of the spectrum. Yeah. And, you know, so for example, to give an impression, so at um, MSR, one of the tools our team has is called... Uh, UI, which is a causal inference library. And that's not specifically a probabilistic programming language. Um, in fact, I don't believe we have any Bayesian abstractions inside of it. But the, uh, the idea there is that you want to kind of give experts a, an interface for writing their model, writing their domain assumptions, and writing their inductive biases. And then, and then all of the kind of causal f- formal logic is, happens on the happens under the hood that kind of um pattern is something i like i like to i like saying like how can i make this how can i make it so that a domain expert can easily transfer their domain knowledge and uh or lack thereof into a model structure and then the the algorithms will work and you know it's scalable so that you don't have to have new algorithms for every domain you know so i think uh probabilistic programming is one way to do that mm-hmm. okay that makes sense. Actually, let's uh, let's start talking about the, the kind of models you work on, and in particular, you develop applications of causal and neurosymbolic artificial intelligence. Uh, so, first, can you define those terms? Tell us what they are about, because it's the first time we talk about that on the podcast. Yeah, I mean, neurosymbolic AI. I think it's you know, the exact definition will depend on who you ask. But for me, what it means is that you're explicitly encoding your inductive biases into the model and in a way that's such that those that inductive bias has some kind of semantic connection to the real the domain that you're modeling what do i mean by that so if we say for example look at how really successful deep learning models have worked when we ask why they work it's usually after somebody has tried really hard to find something uh, that works and then once it works they kind of retrospectively explain oh i see like this convolutional neural network the convolutions with combined with max pooling gives a uh, translation invariance and tr- or translation equivariance right and so and that's great. Those are very useful and, and successful models. Another way of thinking, or one way of saying, like, okay, what I what should ideally happen is that I should say, like, hey, I have a problem where I have some. I'm going to do a computer image, or some work on some on some images, and and hey, by the way, the object in this image is going to stay the same no matter how you translate it across this this, this the uh, area of the image, and so. And then, I, and then t- and taking that kind of domain knowledge and then turning that directly into some artifact in the in the model specification, and you sh- and then somebody else should be able to come and look at the model and be like, ah, oh, I see that sh- in your model you, you've uh, encoded some translation invariance, right? That's very hard to do in a in deep learning. You kind of, you know, if, if it's just translation invariance, yeah, obviously use a convolutional neural network. But you know, if you have some combi- if you you would like to say take some combination of elements of your domain that you know to be true or that you know to be constrained in some setting or some way and turn that into inductive biases for your algorithm. So for your audience, this should be kind of no duh, right? Because that's what Bayesianism was about. It's like, I know this thing about my domain or I don't know this much about my domain and I want to turn that into a prior. And a prior gives inductive bias towards um, the inference of uh, that you're targeting. And so what neurosymbolic AI is, is thinking about you know how do we create powerful learning algorithms that can do that, and you know and why is that challenging? And same reason it's kind of challenging, I think, in Bayesianism is like, all right, well, I'm a biologist and I know you know this about I know these relationships between genes and proteins, and then I think that there's this kind of relationship between this, these two things, but I'm not sure what the parameter is, right? And and so you have to. You're gonna and so I'm gonna say yeah I'm gonna create a prior that reflects all that knowledge and and reflects all that uncertainty, but exactly what how does that happen right How do you turn subjective knowledge or subjective lack of knowledge into a distribution on parameters right That's uh, it's not that easy. In fact, if you say hey 
hey, MRI specialist, is this a normal distribution or is it a gamma distribution? Like, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> like, they don't know. And so like that's interface between the inductive biases of the algorithm and the, the knowledge of the modeler is a place where I like to live. Okay, so maybe you can illustrate that with an example of your work that you particularly like. So do you, do you have one of those in mind and... And that will help us yeah. uh, understand better, I think. Uh, sure. I'll give an example of my work. It's not my most popular work, but it's one that I felt particularly satisfied once I got I submitted it. It's called um, mm -hmm. Integrating Markov Processes with Structural Causal Modeling Enables Counterfactual Inference in Complex Systems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if it sounds like... Very a, poetic uh, name. Yeah. You know, it's funny because it's just like all of these different things that I was interested in and managed to get them to... <laughs> play nice together in one paper and get and, and slip it past reviewers somehow. It's a, it's a Neurops um, paper. I think it was 2019 or 2020. I can't remember. I think it was 19. Yeah, I put that um, but, in your um, show notes. Yeah, and, and so like what I did there was, I'm, I told you I'm really, I, I really like kind of economics and simulation-based modeling and agent-based modeling. So I, um, so in biology, one thing you can do is, um, They're really interested in building, in computational biology, they're interested in building kind of computational models of cells. And so I took one of those computational models and showed how if you solve it for equilibrium and make certain assumptions, you can turn that into a certain kind of causal generative model called a structural causal model. And structural causal models have algorithms that allow you to reason about counterfactual. So a counterfactual, and that term's a bit overloaded, but there's a particular, the broad class of counterfactuals means that, say, I observe some cause and some effect, and then I ask how that effect might have been different if the cause had been different. So mm -hmm. for example, I, my, my, my wife's name is Shan. I married Shan and I'm happy. Would I have been happy had I not married Shan? Right? And so like that is very fundamental to how humans reason. Like we, we think we, you know, that's how kind of we reason about regret. We reason counterfactually about regret and we try to make decisions that would lead to the least regretful outcomes. But it's interesting because we can't actually validate that. There's, there's no way that I can observe what would have happened had I married somebody else. And thus I can't, you know, create the training data set where I, with the label, where one label is the thing that happened in the other universe where I married somebody else, right? And so um, that style of reasoning is really interesting to me because it seems to be very fundamental to how humans reason, but it's lacking from our, our models particularly because we can't validate them. We can't create benchmarks for them. Com computational, uh, in computational psychology, lots of people write papers on this, but you know, they, they write, they're, They validate with experiments and with like, you know, surveys and asking undergraduates to test. But, uh, if you're trying to like do a, you know, a machine learning style paper, it's tougher because the benchmarks don't really exist. So in this paper, I could create a benchmark by using a wholesale model as the benchmark. Say, so, okay, this wholesale model or this, or this bit of a wholesale model is the ground truth, is a simulator of a specific mechanism in the cell. And I'm going to take this simulator and mathematically derive a structural causal model based on this simulator, reason counterfactually about the sim, about this model using standard algorithms for that, those that uh that area that is for structural causal modeling and and causal counterfactual reasoning and then because the i could take the original simulator and kind of simulate the counterfactual by kind of you know rewinding a trajectory and then changing something and then fast forwarding it again under the same random seed that's uh you know some kind of playing god with the simulated universe there and that i can i had a ground truth that i could validate against and uh, i think the, i think the reviewers were just so kind of shocked by all these different things happening that they just uh, threw up their hands and, uh, <laughs> and let it pass. Huh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. But you know, was that paper abstract or did you have, did you take a data set as an example to, to, to show how that worked or was it like more like uh, mathematical reasoning if you want? I mean, we used, so I used, a, I used Pyro to implement the algorithm in uh, using probabilistic programming. I used uh, the counterfactual inference. I used Bayesian inference uh, to infer the counterfactual values, um, specifically stochastic variational inference. And um, 
use a bunch of uh, hacks in the algorithm to get it to work. That's uh, very much inspired by Bayesian techniques. Uh, and um, the I'm trying to remember. I don't think I I assumed ground truth. I I did not. Initially, I was trying to put a prior on the parameters and then kind of take that counterfactual inference and then, and then average across the posterior on those parameters. But I uh, figured it was a bit overkill, and so I'm saving that for another paper. <laughs> okay, so um, definitely I, I'll put that paper in the show notes for people who are interested. And actually... Um, Questions, but I mean that's not my. Just to be clear, that's not my most popular. I mean, I, I think probably the most useful work, um, particularly for computational biologists, is something where much more Bayesian. Something where I did a, I think it's a, it was a Bayesian active learning for basically. I think it was learning signaling network. So basically, it was using causal discovery algorithms, the algorithms that learn a causal graph from data, but then using Bayesian techniques to put a prior on DAGs, uh, um, put a prior on the graph space, and then. Um, and then, kind of being able to average the uh, put the uh, the query on the graph across the posterior on graphs. So, if people want something that's more hardcore Bayesian, that's my Bayesian paper. Oh, okay. Okay. So, tell me where I'm wrong. But from what I understand, like these causal structures that enabled you to do causal reasoning, basically on your models, is basically you've got a model which could be a traditional. Bayesian model, but on top of that, you've got a DAG, so a directed acyclic graph, where you've got mm -hmm. encoded these these directions of how the uh, the variables are related to each other, and yes. that helps you to also understand which variables and which effects could be confounding or could be direct relations, and that's basically what you give to here Pyro. And based on those estimates, you are able to have a causal model. How much of an oversimplification have I done here? I mean, that's about right. Like, um, so if you're taking, so the idea is that, have you ever heard the term model based machine learning? It was a term batted around maybe three or four years, three or four years ago. The idea is that as a modeler, I want to build a model of the data generating process, not the data, but the process that generates the data. And that model should represent relationships between elements of that data generating process. And so one way of representing those relationships is causal relationships. So you can use other things like, uh, you know, a hierarchy or I don't know, an oncology, ontology. You know, causal relationships often come natural. I mean, I think as far as Bayesians go, um, Mikhail Ruth talks a lot about this in his book, Statistical Rethinking, right? Using causal DAGs as a, as a scaffolding for your Bayesian model. And that's the idea that, that, okay, well, I'm going to create this, I'm modeling this process with these variables, and I'm not going to worry about what's in the data yet. I'm going to worry about what's in the data generating process, and I'm going to draw relationships between all of them. Then I get, and then once I get the data, maybe some of those variables are in the data, some of them are not. So if they're not in the data, then they become latent variables in my my model. And now what does it mean to be generative or probabilistic? Well, now we're saying that this data generating process generates data. So I'm going to create a model. I think uh, Mikhail Ruth calls, he uses the analogy um, statistical golems. Is that what he says? That are basically little avatars for this data generating process. And it should generate data. And so probabilistic or generative models are a great way to generate data. Now, where does the Bayesian come in? The Bayesianism comes in when you say like, well, there are parameters of these. You know, so like I say, this variable here is caused by these two variables here. And that causal mechanism has some parametric form. And I need to, but I'm not sure what the parameters are. So I'm going to write them and, and put some priors on them. And maybe if there's two mechanisms that I think are related or similar, then maybe I'll put a, hierarch a hierarchical prior on them so I can kind of pull information across them. You know, so that's kind of where the Bayesianism plays with this causal generative approach. Okay. When you read Michael Roth's book, uh, so Statistical Rethinking, or Udio Pearl's, let's say, more general, for the general public, the book of why, you really mm -hmm. see how DAGs, and Bayesianism can, can really fit together. So then, a question I have is, why don't we do that all the time? Do you think that should be the default 
way of um, writing a model and doing statistics? You know, I might have said, I, I might have used to say that I, that is, that should be the default way. I think now I'm much more agnostic. Like, give an example. So, so one example would be, um, let's use a, co- a common Bayesian. So when people are first learning Bayesianism, they often see the, the eight schools example. This is a study where we're interested in the effect of coaching on standardized testing. And this is because, um, so in the States, we often, we have, we administer standardized tests for college admission called the SAT. And the idea is that this test should be a reflection of your entire kind of, um, education up until, up until that point. And so you shouldn't be able to, pay for a bit of coaching and then be able to to get an edge like that would defeat the purpose of the standardized test because it would be unfair because not everybody can afford coaching but nonetheless companies like Kaplan exist there's lots of coaching services and so the question was does it actually have an effect and so when you see and what they did was uh, it's typically when you see this model presented you see statistics from of uh, kind of average tests scores and some standard deviation across eight different schools with the idea being that there might be some kind of school related influence on the scores say some schools are full of you know are maybe broken down and have bad teachers and the walls are full of asbestos and uh, and there's lead in the water <laughs> and some other schools are really nice and have swimming pools and climbing walls right and so um, you want to incorporate that into their model and typically and so you, typically the way that's presented is kind of like a hierarchy of like you see this little hierarchical graph of or at the bottom of the hierarchy are just samples from each school, student grades from each school, and from in it with each school you have a you know a coaching group and a non-coaching group, and then but then you see this hierarchy of connections between all of the parameters because you're using these, this hierarchical Bayesian technique. But another way of presenting that from a causal standpoint is you have three nodes: school, coaching. So coaching, yes, no, school, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and a third node, which is test score. And then you draw a line from the, uh, from, so you have those two initial nodes are the parents of the, uh, of the third node. And then of course there, there's some issues with extending, you know, generalizing beyond those, those eight schools and causal modeling, it lets you do that as well. That's, there's ways of addressing external validity, but to keep it simple, you just draw that DAG of that three node DAG and from a, you know, and, and so cause, and, and so like that to me, like thinking about the actual elements of the data generating process, like I'm interested in the school and the, the coaching and the outcomes. Those are the actual things that are happening in the world. And then the parameters, that's a separate extraction. So I often kind of make this dichotomy between the Roman parameters, the X and the Ys and the Zs, like schools and, and test scores, and then the Greek parameters, which are the uh, thetas and the nus and the etas and the betas, right? And so, because these are just ways that we parameterize the relation, these causal relationships between these other these other variables. I'm not saying that one way is right or the other, but uh, personally, for me, kind of thinking about it as a DAG, and then thinking about the hierarchy on the parameters, or you know, which you know, pulling partial pulling across schools and all that, that is a separate process is happening. That is how I solve the the problem of my kind of of having uncertainty, my own subjective uncertainty about the nature of these causal relationships. So I'm fairly, you know, if I'm drawing a DAG, I'm fairly certain that these causal relations exist, but exactly the quantities that describe their, the degree of how one causes the other, that's where my uncertainty is. And so now I'm using, say, Bayesian hierarchical, hierarchical modeling to deal with that. You seem to say that's not the way we should not always use that. And yeah, then I'm curious, yeah. what would be the circumstances in which causal generative machine learning is the most helpful and when is this not helpful and for what reasons? So a lot of causal inference, it developed by looking at ways of saying there's some causal thing that you want to estimate. Say, for example, mm-hmm. an average treatment effect or a conditional average treatment effect. And you have a DAG and you have some data. And the question is, okay, how can I use this DAG or some other way of of articulating my causal assumptions about the domain and construct that into an estimand, a, a thing that I can actually estimate from observational data. 
And so like, that's what, if you've, if you've, if you've heard of the do calculus, for example, from causality, if you've heard of things like G estimators and all the, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, here's this causal thing that I want to estimate. Here's some data that didn't come from, you know, an experiment or something like that. And I want to figure out some set of transformations on the data that I can have that are theory that would give me a theoretically valid estimator of that causal query, assuming that my causal assumptions are correct. And so, and so like a lot of the focus in, in um, causal inference research, including from Perl, has, has been on that problem. And it's a very important problem. There is the other thing that you can do is, which is kind of complementary to this, is to say like, well, okay, let's supposing that I know that I have some uh, that I have some causal query, I have some data, and that I know that I could construct an S demand that's valid from the uh, that would work with this data. But what I'm going to do instead, instead of doing all these operations and adjusting for this and you know accounting for that and you know conditioning on this, and I'm going to um, double machine learning or you know propensity score match. Instead of doing all, all of those estimation techniques, what I'm going to do is just create a generative model uh, that represents my data generating process, much like McElroy talks about. And and then use and, and that's and, and since maybe I don't observe everything, there's going to be some latent variables in that model. And when I if I have this causal query, I'm going to use my model to maybe I'm using kind of graph mutilation or I'm using kind of counterfactual algorithms that work on top of that model. And theoretically, that will still work. And so the question is, why don't people do that? I think it's a it's it's part of it is what tools you have here at your disposal. So as you know, part of what makes PyMC and other probabilistic programming languages so great is that you no longer have to write your own custom inference algorithm, right? Like you know, it used to be that if you wanted to do Bayesian inference, you had to go write an MCMC procedure on your own. Now you can, at least to some extent, rely on these algorithms. Um, you know, HMC makes it really easy if you don't have, if you have discrete latent variables and you can do other things. But the, all of that research and all of those techniques evolved in a, in a time when we didn't have those very convenient computational based techniques. So that's one reason. I think the other reason is when you train a fully causal generative model, that's a lot of parameters that you have to train. And, you know, especially if the causal relationships are nuanced and are nonlinear, then, you know, you have to worry about getting certain parameters to, you know, getting the chains to converge and, you know, all these, these things that make Bayesian inference kind of tricky, particularly in complex settings. But if all you want is to estimate one query, and you can just say like, well, I'm just, you know, theoretically, all I have to do is regress this on this and then and then I get yeah, I get an estimator of that thing. Then why wouldn't you do that if it's easier? So like the real motiva motivation of kind of working with a causal generative model is if maybe, you know, you want something, well, you want to do say, you want to use your causal model to do Bayesian decision making under uncertainty. And so there's a part of the decision theory called causal decision theory, which works very well with Bayesian decision theory. And, uh, and so that's, um, that could be a very important use case for you. So if you're already using, say, PyMC to do, I don't know, you have some kind of cost function and you're taking the, and you're looking at the and you're minimizing risk or something like that, this could be something that, that'd be for you. But also, if you say you wanted to kind of train some kind of model artifact and then reuse it, right? So um, you know, say for example, this, we we do this all the time in Bayesianism. We say like, all right, I'm going to train this model, and then I'm going to get some data, and then I'm going to get some posterior samples, and then I'm going to like take these samples and stick them in like a an Amazon S3 bucket, and then next time I want to do an inference, those samples are going to be my, my prior. That kind of uh, repeated use, as opposed to a one-time single inference use case, that falls that you start to get you start to head more towards causal generative machine learning or causal generative modeling territory. And also, if you're already kind of familiar with using latent variable models like topic models, Bayesian non-parametric techniques, uh, hidden Markov models, those types of... Um, if you're already like a, a steady hand at latent variable modeling, then this would come naturally to you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. Is that um, for some cases... It might be. Actually, let me add one more point here. Like one point is is that I think that humans re clearly reason causally, 
right? In fact, we tend to be better at reasoning about cause and effect than we do at reasoning about probability. And, you know, and cognitive scientists, we, they think that we have these kinds of causal simulators, particularly in certain domains, like they call these folk physics or folk psychology, which is, you know, say, for example, you, and there was a study that kind of used eye tracking movements. You, so like you, uh, you ask, you know, you, somebody hits a billiard ball and it's going towards the hole and then somebody else hits the, hits the ball with another ball before it, it goes into the hole. And then you ask them, would the ball have gotten into the hole had they not struck it? And then what happens is you see the human, their eyes kind of track the path to the hole that didn't, you know, so their, their eyes are actually tracking the counterfactual trajectory, which suggests that they're imagining what would have happened. And, and, you know, so causality is all about that, that sort of thing, right? And so, like, um, our algorithms for causality, so when you say, for example, I'm going to use this propensity score approach to estimate this average treatment effect, right? Like, that's clearly not what's happening in our head. In our head, there's some kind of simulator-based approach happening where we're simulating the outcome and then, um, and then kind of intuiting about cause and effect that way. And so arguably, if you're looking for something that's closer to the cognitive science approach to an algorithm for solving a problem that's much more aligned with how humans think about the problem, then, then that's be another reason that you want to use that kind of approach, the causal generative modeling approach. Okay, okay, yeah. So to try and sum, and sum up what you just said, to you, causal generative machine learning is important. Well, that may sound trivial, but especially when you are actually interested in the causal effect of a treatment on an outcome, that's first, you need to be really interested in that and, and wanting to estimate not only the correlations, but the directions of the effects. But you have to know that it may make your, your, the model building process maybe uh, less trivial, uh, more difficult than, than in the, in the classic setting, because you need to add another I layer. I think the model building. Sorry. And actually, actually I think the, the causal generative approach to model building approach is actually easier because it's easier to think about cause and effects than it is to be thinking about correlation. Yeah, that's, um, the, that's the trouble not what is I that mean. Trading the I, model, I, might I, be I mean more, the code, more nuance. I mean the code. Actually, I think the code is easier too because, like, from my experience as an engineer, if I, you know, let's say I write a causal graphical model, like mm -hmm. a causal Bayes net, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in theory, every single tuple of children and parents is an independent mechanism, right? I should be able to like, if this actually re represents a real world causal relationship, then there's a certain kind of causal invariance that I would expect to be independent, you know, make that relationship independent of the data set. If I, and I might be wrong about the model, but if my model is right, then there should be some invariance there. Which means that from an engineering standpoint, I can write a unit test that just tests that single component of the model. Right. And so that is, I think, another understated power of causal modeling in, in machine learning, which is, you know, in a world where we have these giant models that, uh, and if there's something, if something's changed or something's wrong, then we have to retrain it from scratch. If we could, if we can use causal invariance to kind of break our model up into components and then manage those components separately in code using just Normal software engineering patterns have been around for the last 30 years, like, uh, you know, separation of abstraction, writing, you know, write unit tests that test individual components of your code. That leads to much more robust approaches as well. That gets a lot less play because, you know, the people who, it's not engineers who dominate the conversation about mm -hmm. AI and yeah. it's, uh, it's, uh, the researchers. So that actually, like, that actually makes sense to me in the sense that you're basically adding more structure to a model when you when you add a causal structure like that. So composable structures. Uh, yeah. yeah. And usually adding more structure means that it should get easier to sample from your model if like the assumptions are not completely wrong. So mm -hmm. that gets me back to the question I was asking you before. If this framework of causal generative machine learning and do calculus allows you to not only estimate correlations, but also causalities, that it makes the code and the sampling better, or at least not worse, and that it's easier to reason about because it's more just interpretable and intuitive for humans, why don't we use that all the time? What's the cost? Is there a, a big cost of using that? 
apart from path dependency that you mentioned before? I would say that, so let's say that we're focusing on a kind of applied causal inference problem. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times, once you're applying it, it's like, I need to solve this particular problem. And then you start thinking about, not so much about your causal assumptions, you've already validated them. Not so much about um, what's the right data to solve the problem, you've already, you already have the data, you've already, you, know, you probably already have a lot of it. So at that point, it becomes a question of scalability and, and reducing and, and increasing the precision of your estimator. And, and so a lot of the... The research, is the kind of development of research, they'll focus very much on, say, what's the kind of the best technique that you can use to to get the answer to this particular style of problem with this particular style of data, and make it so that it works with the size of your data and that it um, is as precise as possible. And at that point, it's just a statistical inference problem. And so, chances are that if they are using some particulars statistical inference technique that there's a Bayesian analog to it that would do just as well in terms of reducing variance and uh, working on a large data set or working on a very small data set or whatever it is your, your data set size problem is. And so, you know, I think then, so yeah, there's clear path dependency, but also just if I'm going to use a generative modeling approach to solve this, and then, you know, what do I have to be good at? Do I have to be good at, you know, A, working with PyMC or, you know, Pyro, which is based on TensorFlow, and if there's, sorry, based on PyTorch, so if there's if there's bugs, I have to be able to, de to debug uh, PyTorch errors, which are famously cryptic. If I, uh, and on top of that, I have to, uh, maybe I have to implement some kind of inference algorithm. So if I, if it's, if all of my latent variables are continuous then I can use HMC, but even then I have to like look at the traces of my Markov chain and I have to look at the, the R hat values and, uh, you know, the number, you know, the effective sample size and all these things. I have to learn a bunch of, a bunch about Bayesian statistics. If I'm using stochastic variational inference, then I have to learn how to you know, write a deep learning style training procedure. And when things break, I have to be able to diagnose them. Or I can import this R library and it's just going to work. And so, and it's, it already has, you know, and this famous professor at this famous university has already given it his stamp of appro approval or her stamp of approval. <laughs> Some people like Susan Athey, for example, who are just, who, who brings so much kind of credibility to the domain. Like, are you really going to try your fancy Bayesian general modeling approach when this is what all the, uh, the smart people say you ought to be doing? That's the challenge. And so I think building interfaces to these types of, of approaches and also focusing on problems that the other approaches can't solve. So like one of the interesting things about these kind of counterfactual reasoning problems, particularly when you're interested in the outcome in the observed world and the outcome in the counterfactual world, something we call multiverse counterfactuals. Those are particularly challenging to do with uh, more statistical, or more traditional causal inference techniques or statistical techniques. And so you need some of these more structured models to be able to address those. And, and so the real, I think the real important thing there is, is not only creating the interface so people can do that, but also showing particular applications where it's particularly important. Thanks. That's, that's much clearer now. I really see your point. And related to that, time is flying by. So we're going to get to the last two questions in, in, in the, in a moment, but two quick questions before that. Related to, to what you just said, what do you think are the main challenges of the of your field right now, or of the field of causal generative modeling? What do you think are the most important point that the field has to tackle to help people embrace it more? Maybe I would like to see some advances in probabilistic programming. Um, I think you know, I think you might have alluded to this a little bit at the beginning of the conversation, which is you know that a lot of people who work on probabilistic programming are they're much more on the programming languages side trying to um you know, does this if i do this procedure in my probabilistic programming what is what does measure theory have to say about it and um i think kind of we want to continue doing work in making probabilistic programming probabilistic modeling more accessible to domain experts and make it so that you don't have to be 
good at too many things to uh, like computer science and Bayesian inference and your domain and debugging, uh, you know, you know, backprop style um, uh, frameworks. And so like... Um, you don't have to be a core dev of, uh, of 12 open source packages. To right, exactly. <laughs> Once we can do that, we can start, we're going to want to show some of the use cases for causal modeling in... The non most of the causal inference applications have tended to be on causal effect inference because we're very much interested in, you know, does this vaccine impact your propensity to contract COVID, right? Like those are very important policy questions. But we do know that there's a whole broad range of causal questions that are not about causal effects, but about, you know, some of the explanation, algorithmic recourse, responsibility, blame, actual causality, which is, you know, if something happened, understanding why it happened, right? We know that these are very important questions to ask in domains like agent modeling and reinforcement learning. I think we haven't done very a, a very good job in showing use cases where these this type of reasoning is, is important and impactful. We have a lot of toy examples, but we, I think we want to we want to have like a like an alpha go movement uh, moment for for those type for that kind of reasoning, you know, like like you know Daniel Kahneman system two reasoning style alpha go moments, and and for that to happen, I think that we need to extend causal inference, like formal causal inference theory from beyond the DAG to models where, you know, it's a program or maybe there's an open number of variables. Maybe there's some, there's recursion, things like that. And um, and so right, right now the theory there is very, very scant and weak. And so um, I think those are some, some uh, frontiers that we can push against. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it does look to me like... Um it's quite a recent field, basically, and and there is so much to do and improve on that. And yeah, especially as you said, the the programming part, the software part, which is still missing for now. Which is, I mean, not all it takes time to for for things to to settle down and and then see. Okay, that's where we should go. That's the most important direction. So you just talked about the future of 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 the field and what you would like to see. I'm wondering, as a last question. If there are things you would not like to see, are there things that you, you think uh, you think are, uh, w would be detrimental? I am impressed with what we've accomplished with using, say, big models like GPT three to um, make impressive advances, particularly in the domain of natural language. And and the way I think about that is, it's it's kind of a brute forcing of a problem, right? I'm going to train a very large model to uh, and see how far it can kind of get on a certain set of benchmarks. And then once you've gotten there you've and you've figured out how to, uh, you, you've shown that it can be done, right? Now the question is, all right, well, how can we do so? You know, what can we understand? Now that we know we can do it, how did we do it? And I like research that goes in that direction. So some of this research that's like a, uh, you know, what do they call it? GP, GPTnomics or GPTology or whatever, trying to understand why it works and then hopefully kind of develop models that are not, you know, rather than abstracting some of the things that make it work in, in an architecture that you can't understand, actually bringing them to the forefront and making them reproducible across different models, making the things that if there's something insofar as a model can understand the semantic structure of a language domain, let's understand how it works and, um, and, and make sure that we can, uh, engineer it uh, consistently and I'm, I'm, p I'm picking on the natural language example because it's a uh, it's a particular example of okay we've, br we've brute forced the problem and and now we know we can do it uh, and then now we also know that there's some kind of structure to this problem and so the, we have a choice about whether or not to go and focus on the structure or to build even bigger models and spend even more money and more carbon on on those bigger models and um I think going in the direction of spending more money and more carbon to build the bigger models is a less desirable direction from my perspective. It's something that's not only is from a research standpoint, I think problematic, but it's also, it siphons resources away from other kinds of research and, and um, other kinds of uh, engineering efforts. And so I think that, uh, and it's also, you know, bad for the environment. Great answer. Love that. Very happy to end the show on that note. <laughs> so thanks for yeah, taking the time to, 
to think about that question. But before I let you go, uh, you know that I have to ask you the last two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. So the first one is if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? I would try to build a virtual assistant that could kind of sit on my shoulder and tell me when my, you know, the heuristics and, and cognitive biases that affect my decision making are leading me astray. And, um, and so like be a kind of system, you know, so Kahneman talks about system one and system two, I just would be a system three. That's kind of a, a layer on top. You know, this thing would build a model of me and my decision making. And then, and then whenever I was making an error or some external thing like you know an instagram feed were sabotaging my my own desire to achieve my goals and live in, and, and live the life that i want a life that i want to live and um whenever it detected that this was happening it would let me know and then i would be and basically intervene on the data generating process that is my decision making i think i am working on that but uh I have a lot more kind of <laughs> milestones that I have to show to my supervisor before I can talk up or before I can just work directly on that. Yeah, I see. Yeah. No, I love that. Definitely when you come up with a, a beta test, send it my way. I'm, I'm, in to, I'm in to test that. I love that too. Okay, second question is if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, who would it be? I suppose it would be Alan Turing. I don't know how he'd get on, but um, I, I mean, there's um, you know, some of the advancements particularly. I mean, you know, one of the things that got me interested in Bayesianism was reading um, The Theory That Would Not Die, a book on the history of Bayesianism, and kind of it was the first time I, as a student, kind of envisioned what it was like kind of working on Enigma and... Um, and uh, Bleshley, um, in Bleshley Park during the war and um, would have liked to have been a fly on the wall and just kind of understand how he was thinking about the problem without any of the frameworks and the materials that we have today. That would have been interesting. I think um, kind of runner-up would be Claude Shannon. Awesome, yeah. No, those, <laughs> all those choices. My guess is that you've had other guests use those. It's, I feel it's kind of like yeah, almost although, uh, a cliche. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, Alan Turing doesn't come up that that as often as I would expect, uh, expect actually. So, so yeah, like, uh, seems like this dinner would not be that crowded, but very interesting. Um, <laughs> I'd be at that, at that dinner, though, of course, yeah as I'm organizing it. Okay, well, I could talk a bit, uh, a lot more, <laughs> Robert, but um, yeah, I have to call it a show. That's already uh, a lot of time you've given me. So I want to thank you. It was yeah, really um, an inspiring conversation and um, intellectually challenging. So I hope it was the same for listeners. And as usual, I put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Robert, for taking the time and being on this show. Thank you for having me. I had a really good time. Yeah, well, come back anytime uh, with your System 3. <laughs> See you. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good Bayesian. and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation. Yeah.